Showtime! It's been a long time and many characters since I did the last one of these. The previous two still have a lot of useful information. It might also explain why something that is a bit more obvious isn't in this one. Especially since now for some characters, I'm really scraping the bottom of the barrel, but I'm still trying to at least offer something. No characters left behind in this series, even if their kit is as simple as toasting bread. They may not get the most interesting inclusion, but at least they're here. Both Zhongli and Geo Traveler both have the capability of using their constructs to block large monsters like Magukenki or the Samurai from ever jumping backwards. These mechanics can be kind of annoying in a fight, and as long as you fight with their backs turned to one of these constructs, they can leap into them and stop them from going anywhere. The cooldown of Albedo's skill, albeit an already short one, can be bypassed by placing a new one down and immediately attacking, allowing you to get a little extra burst of damage, which isn't really that helpful, but if something ever lives with a tiny bit of health and you don't want to waste anyone else's stuff, it helps. Or maybe you just like enjoy being on field with Albedo as much as humanly possible, and this will improve his damage. Maybe you have Horizon Fever. Maybe you just want to use Aloy in any way humanly possible. She's got a long cooldown skill, which generates a pretty good amount of particles. This makes her have pretty good synergy with the Sacrificial Bow, and with a little bonus of if the initial hit doesn't reset the skill, the mines give an additional chance. Amber C2 is ever so slightly misleading. It says shoot the foot of Baron Bunny, but what it really means is the ground that it's standing on. Combine this with how C4 lets you have two Baron Bunnies out, and you can easily detonate them both by just shooting the little bit of ground where their areas overlap. Granted, if you're actually playing Amber as a main field DPS, you might want to melt or vape each Baron Bunny individually rather than blowing them both up at once, but it is an option. Both Mona and Ayaka have access to the exact same trick that allows them to cover basically any distance without spending any stamina whatsoever. It may not be the fastest method, but by strafing repeatedly without holding forward, you take advantage of a little turn that does move you forward and takes almost no stamina because you haven't actually started sprinting yet. Now this trick is a lot more useful for Mona than it is for Ayaka because Ayaka can at least freeze the water and she can basically travel infinite distance at max speed for as long as she doesn't screw up freezing the water. When using Ayato's burst, make sure to take full advantage of Z4 passive by swapping off after using it and doing whatever you need to do on your support characters. Or also, in the Spiral Abyss, just make sure you put Ayato in your first slot, so that when you start the next floor, if you just used a burst and you didn't quite get your energy back, you have time to regen a little bit before the floor begins. Barber's Charge Attack actually still has one of the highest motion values among all Catalyst users. This means that if you are dedicated to a life of Barber main DPS, there is some validity to playing her as a Charge Attack character. On top of burning ground enemies and all that stuff, Beto can actually get her perfect counter in another way, detonating her own explosive barrel and immediately countering it for a perfect counter. Pretty stylish way of blowing up a bomb, and not getting yourself killed like I do all the time. Normally, Bennett's tap skill generates two to three particles on a random chance. However, you can actually rig the three particles a little in your favor by holding this skill just a little bit before the second charge actually activates, and this does increase your chance of getting three particles. This takes your original 5-10% to chance for a third particle all the way up to a 60% chance. A well-known combo to most at this point, definitely, but Shenha and Chongyun together can basically make any fast attacker the cryo carry of their dreams. It doesn't have to be one fast attacker, you can do a quick swap team, you can add Yunjin on top to do even more damage, you have a ton of options for this team. It's also pretty off meta, but still a lot of fun. For you C4 Diluc Wanters and Havers who don't know what the hell in rhythm means, don't worry. They actually put a little visual and audio indicator whenever it's ready for the next hit. Uh. Uh. When playing in co-op with Diona, having her C2 allows you to shield your teammates. However, they don't benefit from the held version. They get a 5 second shield regardless, so if you're playing in co-op, just try to avoid using the held version as you're not shielding your teammates as much as you could be.
Using the small delay before Eulo's burst actually detonates, you can swap off to a character like Rosaria who has a teleport and actually teleport to a target and then detonate the bomb there. Given they're already common teammates, pretty useful thing to know. And it's just kind of fun. Normally, Oz can't activate pressure plates. However, if you actually shoot him with a charge shot, he all of a sudden can, and he'll start shooting it. You do you, Oz. People who own Ganyu definitely already know this from trial and error, but the limit at which you can kill things with Ganyu is basically how far away you can see them. She doesn't really get punished by damage fall off like most other bow characters do. Save yourself some money and resources on Goro by only leveling his skill. His burst actually uses the values from his skill to buff you, so the damage is really the only thing you're gaining from leveling the burst, and Goro's personal damage is already incredibly low and talent levels aren't really fixing that. When farming artifacts for Hu Tao, it's really easy to get caught up in the exact same mad dash for crit stats that every other character except, you know, Kakomi gets stuck into. However, given that Hu Tao vapes almost all of her damage in her best team comps, it's actually really good to go for elemental mastery, especially if you have zero. Ushi's cooldown of 10 seconds allows you to perfectly throw one just as you start Ito's burst and just before it ends. This not only allows you to open and start with huge burst damage, not to mention start with some stacks, but it's also a nice little timer on how much time you have left on Ito's burst. When using Jean for CC or grouping, sometimes she works against you by sending some monsters flying and some stay right in front of her, basically. Well, before you send the enemies flying, either by timing out or doing it manually, you can actually just jump, and then the monsters will be in a neat little pile in front of you, ready to do whatever you want to them. Another well-known combo, but hey, some characters don't have much to go off of. Xiangling and Kaya both have bursts that circle around them, and if you actually go counterclockwise, you make the bursts hit a little bit faster. Add Sayu into the mix, who already moves naturally while she's spinning in her ball, and you got a pretty cool little team comp that just spins. Lots of spinning. Of course, you can take advantage of Kaya and Xiangling's circular bursts without the need of adding someone like Sayu into it. It just makes it a little bit more fun. The jump from Kazuo's skill actually allows you to iframe or just, well, outright dodge a lot of different attacks in the game. I can't possibly showcase them all here because honestly, I don't, I don't even know them all. But as you use them and as you try them out, you'll realize that a lot of different ones can be dodged. Some a little less obvious than others. You don't even have to worry about perfect timing. A lot of time you just hang in the air for an extra second and then you'll dodge attacks by doing that. Or you can actually just time it perfectly and waste no time. In the case of running Kaching in your party as the only Electro unit alongside a Viridus and Veneer debuffer, you can actually get the resistance shred without having to compromise on any of Kaching's buffs. All you have to do is first use her skill, swap to your Animo unit, debuff them, swap back, and then recast your skill. This way you don't have to waste an infusion or any time on her buff after using her burst. Of course, after the first rotation, there might just be a good chance that they're permanently affected by Electro anyway, so, you know. Please attack and charge attack can break rocks. It's, it's very exciting stuff. I may not have footage of this, and I'm way too lazy to go into the Abyss just to show this off, but Kakomi is one of the best characters to solo a Pyro Abyss Lector. The shield part, anyway. With her skills near permanent nut time, all you need to do is rotate through her attack, charge attack, and skills damage, and you will shred the shield very quickly, all while ignoring every mechanic he has. Lisa's skill has an absolutely, totally unnecessary, ridiculous vertical range. <laughs> Do with this information what you will. Applying Cryo to the ore before you hit it with Ningguang's auto attacks increases the damage that does to the ore significantly. This may not be the most useful thing in practice, but it is kind of cool. If you're going to use White Blind on Noel, make sure you do some auto attacks before you start your first rotation. Noel's burst does snapshot defense, so getting that extra up to 48% defense can make a pretty big difference. By using Chi Chi's skill before you jump into water, you can basically start an Ice Bridge or a Mona Sprint from literally anywhere.
With Dendro on the horizon, a skill like Razor's that has a very low cooldown and a high application of Electro may potentially be useful for a Dendro reaction. Alongside the fact that his C4 also shreds defense, which is a very rare property on a character, Razor actually has some validity as a support unit. Sarah's Elemental Burst is actually capable of hitting multiple times, it just takes a large target to be able to do it, but when it happens, it absolutely shreds targets. With the help of her C4 and her C6, it can be absolutely devastating amounts of damage on the right target. Raiden Shogun has an insane amount of combos at her disposal, and they change up whether you have attack speed or not. If you want a tried and true combo that's very easy to do, very easy to repeat once you got the muscle memory down and is very effective, you can't go wrong with the N3C times 3 into N1C. You get the benefit of multiple charge attacks which have insane AoE, plus the benefit of the charge attack at the very end which artificially increases the duration of Raiden's burst by just a little bit. Whatever combo you want to do is up to you, whether you want to go for the highest damage or the easiest to do, I think this is a good power. Sucrose's skill actually targets the ground, which allows you to do some stuff like this in the overworld. It can be pretty useful to kill stuff from above like this, or blow up bombs from a safe distance, and not blow yourself up all the time like I do. Gonna be real here, Child was one of the hardest ones to come up with anything for. The best I got is to point out the fact that Child is doomed to lead others to a treasure that he can never obtain himself. And that is his passive. He is arguably one of the best passives in the entire game, if not the best. The only problem is he himself doesn't really benefit from it. However, if you ever desperately need a Hydro character to destroy like a Pyro Shield or something, Child can do that exceptionally well, while also providing a decent sized damage buff to literally anyone who benefits from mostly normal attacks. Of course, there will almost always be a better support that can add more damage, but you know, this is an option. The shield that Toma's burst offers doesn't actually require you to do normal attack damage to trigger. All it requires you to do is a normal attack motion. That means any normal attack, whether it be Raiden's burst swings or a random bow shot, will trigger the shield, even at a range. That means you can safely use Toma with a character like Ganyu without having to worry about being close enough range to trigger the shield bonus. You just have to weave in an auto every once in a while to actually be able to stack it up. Venti's held skill has always been really amazing for exploration. However, all this time later, well, for a while now, we've been able to take it a lot further. We can now put it on top of something like Zhongli's Pillar and then go even further beyond that and use Kazuha's skill to go even higher. Now, if only we could swap characters mid-air and then start using Xiao's skill to go forward. Uh, maybe one day they'll let us do that. If you're building Xiao with something like Two-Piece Gladiator, Two-Piece Viridus, and Veneer, you can actually get away with using an attack percent goblet. You see, Xiao has a ridiculous amount of percent damage bonuses from his talents. However, if you're switching over to the Vermilion Hereafter set, it is a good idea to still use Animo Damage Percent. The insane amount of percent attack we get from this set tips the scales in favor of Animo Damage Percent again. Of course, pretty much just go with whatever your best substats are. If you have an insane attack percent goblet, there's a good chance an Animo Percent that's guard garbage isn't going to beat it. There are optimizers out there that can help you figure this kind of stuff out. If you're curious, I highly recommend using them, especially if you don't really feel comfortable building characters by yourself. They're really helpful for characters that have more complicated stat priorities like Hu Tao or Xiao or, you know, multiple other characters. If there's ever a time where you are stuck without a healer, whether it be by forgetfulness or fault of your own, or maybe an event's randomness, you can use Xing Chou to heal your party up. It'll be very slow, and you can do it in the downtime of an event or something, or maybe the abyss if you have an excess of time for some reason with a dead character in your party. It's a nice little last resort option to have, which I have had to use before in the roguelike event when I killed my Bennett by accident, but you know, I, I made it. Most older players, especially Shin Yan players, probably know this trick by now, but for you would-be Shin Yan or Spin Yan mains, you can actually extend the duration of her charge attack for the entire duration of her stamina bar by pressing escape or whatever your menu button is on your platform of choice and then continuing to spin for as long as your stamina bar can handle it. When I use Yaimiko's skill, I like to make sure my movements always go in the shape of a staple. It'll always drop your totems in a perfect little triangle, which just looks nice. You always want to make sure they're together to do maximum damage, and this just puts them in a neat little pile in the same way every single time. 
Yenfei is consistently one of the hardest characters to come up with anything for this list. If you're looking for basically any reason to use her under the sun, using her inside of Toma for Hu Tao is a pretty good option. Her C4 allows you to build her as a shield bot that can also apply the pyro that Toma normally would to VV with a character like Kazuha. She also gets the benefit of thrilling tales and also being a better alternative to Toma than an Amber holding Elegy for the end, because everyone has that lying around. When you combine factors like the fact that Yilong can regenerate stamina during her skill's use, or animal resins reducing the cooldown of her skill and reducing stamina consumption with a passive like Kazuha, she can basically run indefinitely, and at a very high speed, faster than pretty much anyone else can. And while Sayu can't regenerate stamina while she runs, you can use Sayu's ball to then regenerate her cooldowns. This combined with the fact that Yilan is a bow character with a charge shot that is kinda like Ganyu's just on a small cooldown, and she can hunt animals with that, she is an incredibly valuable exploration unit. Yoimiya may have a very easy and obvious build path with the Sheminawa's artifact set. It's what most of us gravitated towards when she came out, and it's what we still gravitate towards now. It is a solid option, and many of us do have good Sheminawa's pieces from Farming Emblem for other characters. However, my tip for Yoimiya is a simple one. If you still believe that her burst is not worth using, that Sheminawa's is the best and only option for her, I implore you to look into it more because that is not the case. It is a fantastic option, it is a good option, but it is not the best one, and her burst is indeed worth using. Yunjin is a very similar unit to Goro in the terms that her personal damage isn't very high. Sure, her counter can hit pretty hard. However, if you're willing to forgo that damage a little bit in favor of just maximizing her support capabilities for your other units while also staying within a budget build, two-piece husk, two-piece defender actually offers more percent defense than what four-piece husk does without the requirement. The only thing you gotta make sure you do here is if you do go down that route, make sure the defender pieces are flower and feather because their base stats are basically irrelevant here. Being a four-star means the defense rolls you get on the substats will be lesser, but let's be real. When do they ever go our way, especially into a singular stat? Remember to check the first two of these out because they got dibs on the best information I had on some characters. Just remember something more obvious might have been mentioned in the previous two, so remember that before you comment below on why didn't you include this? Well, that might be why. But if you know of something more helpful, don't forget to leave it in the comments below. Thank you for watching, don't forget to check out my socials, Patreon, all that stuff in the links below. Have a good day and I will see you in the next one.